Welcome to What is Next. What is Next is a very educative program on GBC and GTV, the authentic and trusted voice of Ghana. We look for people we consider to be people with accumulated wisdom, people who are thought leaders of our country at the moment. And we get closer to such people to help us find relevant answers to such challenges confronting us. And today, just by grace, I'm coming to you with a lady with many parts. She, in fact myself, my teacher, but a former director, Institute of Africa Studies, University of Ghana. But she has also been a former director Social Development Policy Division of the United Nations Economic Commission of Africa, based in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. And if we want to continue, we can add on, on, and on, and on. One of the very strong voices in Ghana at the moment when it comes to issues of women empowerment. I'm talking about uh, Professor Abra Techua Men. Prof. Welcome to What is Next. Thank, Thank you very, very much. much. Oh, I would have loved to shake your hands, but uh, sorry because of COVID, but we are happy that you've made time to be with us. Some of us may know bits and bits and pieces of you, but just help my viewers. Who is Professor Techua? Thank you very much, Reverend, and thank you for having me on your program today. Um, it's hard to talk about yourself. Um, I'm a, a retired professor of the University of Ghana, currently holding the title of Professor Emerita of, the, of African Studies at the Institute of African Studies at the University of Ghana. I'm also Vice Chair of the National Development Planning Commission. Um, of course, I'm female. Um, I come from a very large family. I was born in Kumasi, um, started my primary education there, and proceeded to Wesley Girls High School, um, where I did my O and A levels, and enrolled at the University of Ghana in 1971 at the Faculty of Law, and uh, went on and was called to the bar in, um, actually I finished in 1976, I finished my bar, but immediately I finished, I proceeded to Tanzania, to the University of Dar es Salaam, to do a master's program in law. So I could not be called to the bar with my colleagues. So I did a private call the following year when I had come to Ghana to do my field work uh, for my master's thesis. And, um, I was employed at the University of Ghana and spent virtually all my adult life working at the University of Ghana. Much later on in life, I went to the United States to do a PhD in anthropology at uh, Indiana University in Bloomington, Indiana. I have two grown-up children. Um, my daughter is a, is a lawyer. She's a, a partner at a law firm in New York. And my son is here. He currently is an engineer and he works here in Ghana. And I'm blessed with a grandson. Mm -hmm. Now, Prof, I, I know there are young people who, people like you, they want to consider you as their mentors, you inspire uh, all of us. But are there values that you have cherished, whether in your professional life, uh, uh, academic, whatever, that values that you don't want to disconnect from, that some of these young people must know that uh, you've come such far, but you have your own shock absorbers. Certainly, Osofo. I went to Wesley Girls High School. Our school motto is live pure, speak true, right wrong, follow the king. And the king there is King Jesus. And uh, when you go to Wesley Girls, you are trained. You are trained. To, to be a person of integrity, to stand up for the truth, no matter what. And I certainly absorbed those values, the confirmed values that I had growing up, where 
I, I developed a very keen sense of justice quite early on in my life, growing up in a, in a, a large household with many siblings, you know, my father had other wives, etc. So um, I had a keen sense of justice and I think the education that I had at Wesley Girls really formed me and confirmed me in those values of really standing up for injustice. You know, in Wesley Girls, one of the things that we used to do was that we would go to the surrounding villages to work with um, the people who lived there. We used to go to Ankafol Leprosarium and um, the psychiatric hospital in Ankafol. So we were trained to look out for people less fortunate than ourselves and to, to give, to share, not to feel privileged. In fact, we were made to know that to whom that much is given, much is expected. And I think that I have carried and cherished these values all my life, that life is not about what you can get for yourself. It, it's, it's much more rewarding to give than to receive and to have integrity. I think that it is really important. And of course, uh, at the University of Ghana, the motto is, Integri prokidamus, eh? Integri, integrity above all else. You know, it, 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 it proceeds before you, it surrounds you. And, and I, have, I have personalized these values in my life and, and I would recommend them strongly to anybody who wants to get ahead. That you get ahead not by grabbing, you know, but by seeing yourself and your life as one of service to other people. And, and, and Prof, I mentioned it, you taught me when I was pursuing Master of Philosophy at the University of Ghana. And we always want to say thank you to that mother feeling that people who come around you. But you may also have one or two people that you also want to uh, say thank you to, whether uh, dead or alive. Certainly, Osofo. As they say, if you can read something, thank a teacher. I thank the teachers in my life. My parents did not have formal education. My, my father was self-educated. But my, my, my parents believed in education, believed in the power of education for all their children, male or female, encouraged us. You know, I remember um, at some point, my grandfather, who was himself educated, my mother's father, coming to the house. And we, we, my mother had eight children, five girls and three boys. And my grandfather felt that we, we were just going on with education. So at some point he was saying to my mother, Echa, like these girls, like when are they going to stop and have children? And my mother brushed him off. So it, it was very revealing to me that, you know, uh, my mother who had not had education, herself, formal education, she was a very sophisticated woman, had not had formal education, very sophisticated, could say to her father, leave them alone. Like when they want to, they will have children, you know. So I thank my parents very much for supporting me. I thank my teachers. I mean, along the line, the other day I was trying to remember who must have influenced me to go to Wesley Girls. Well, certainly not my parents. I don't think my parents knew about Wesley Girls. So it was one of my teachers when I was sitting for the common entrance because a lot of my mates went to Achimota school. I could have gone to Achimota school. One of my teachers encouraged me to go to Wesley Girls. And I think that that must be one of the single most decisive decisions in my life. So I want to thank all of them for setting me on my way and uh, for helping me grab the opportunities that came my way. Yes. Viewers, this is what is next. And I'm in conversation with Professor Abra Techua Menu on violence against women. Now, Prof, we have gone to Beijing and back. We have a whole ministry of children, gender, and uh, social protection. Several uh, uh, women groups working on women empowerment. Now, why? do we still have records of terrible violence against women in Ghana, especially in the name of witchcraft? Thank you very much, Reverend. Um, 
Violence against women, or what is now better known as gender-based violence, is a global phenomenon. Globally, about 30% of women experience some form of gender-based violence on account of the fact that they are women or they inhabit a female body. So it is, it is a, a global problem which has um, drawn global attention and especially recently in this era of COVID-19, um, there, there has been a lot of concern that rates of uh, gender-based violence may be going up because people are cooped in. Imagine that you live with an abusive person. And then, especially during the periods of lockdown, etc., you had nowhere to go. All of that increased the chances of violence against women. And uh, also, you know, some people have lost their jobs, all the frustrations, etc. They take it out. So violence against women or gender-based violence is a manifestation of power relations in society. And it is usually the more powerful. I'm not suggesting that men, some men don't experience uh, gender-based violence. They do, but they are in a minority, you know. And they, it can be physical abuse. It can be sexual violence. It can be um, harmful practices like female genital mutilation. It can be um, traditional beliefs like witchcraft, accusations. It can be child marriage. You know, part of the pro worry is that because uh, girls especially have not been in school, that parents who may withdraw their daughters and give them away to be married. So there is a lot of concern. and both the United Nations and the African Union have called for governments to ensure that in their national responses against COVID-19, that they pay attention to um, gender-based violence and put measures in place. So yes, we've been to Beijing and back, and in Beijing, um, in the Beijing Platform for Action, violence against women was one of the critical demands, you know, in there. We have a ministry for, um, gender, children, and social protection. We have a national gender policy. In the national gender policy, attention has been drawn to gender-based violence. We have a domestic violence and victim support unit within the police services. We have a lot of, um, we, we now have a gender, gender violence courts, you know, to deal with the problem. We have a lot of civil society organizations dealing with the problem. And uh, it hasn't gone away because it's a human problem and the human beings are still here. <laughs> and most of the time, they still feel emboldened to do what they have always done. And, uh, you know, so it's, it's, a, it's a lot of things. You know, we've got, we've got some form of architecture to deal with it. Um, but there are a lot of issues. There are a lot of issues, yes. And, um the former UN Secretary General, Mr. Kofi Annan, once stated in a report as far back as 2006 that violence against women uh, was a pandemic. And this is from him, that violence against women and girls is a problem of pandemic proportions. At least one out of every three women around the world has been beaten, coerced into sex, or otherwise abused in her lifetime with the abuser usually someone known to her. Now, have, can we say that violence against women in Ghana today is a pandemic? Hmm. I guess when we, when we hear the term pandemic, we usually think of disease, yeah. right? <laughs> but to the extent, if you have one in three women, and I think I quoted it also um, when I was talking about the global mm -hmm. figures, it's no different in Ghana. In fact, um, a study that was done by ISA, the Institute for Social Statistical and Economic Research, and some other researchers, just published just last year on the economic cost of violence against women, found that um, intimate partner violence in Ghana for women aged between 18 to 60 years was 43%. That is very high, almost one in two women. 
And beyond the intimate partner violence, some of those women also suffered violence from other family members. You know. So if we think of a pandemic as something that is widespread, you know, that um, you cannot almost do nothing about, perhaps we could apply that to this to it. But I would say that to the ex we can do much more about gender-based violence than perhaps we can do about COVID-19, you know. So the, it's rampant. It is rampant and it is uh, um, disturbing. And we, we appear not to have done enough about it, especially when you look at the figures that are published by the police service and by DOFSU in terms of how many people report, only about 10%, 11% of people report any form of violence that is uh, meted out to them, you know, because often uh, either the police service is far away or usually um, they are pressured by other family members, by pastors, <laughs> by uh, neighbors, by all kinds of people to settle the matter at home. So we, we haven't even talked about, now we're talking about women, we haven't talked about children, we haven't talked about girls, you know. I mean, the, the, the levels of defilement against children in Ghana, that is truly an epidemic. I mean, when you read about it in the newspapers, 60-year-old man defiles a 10-year-old child, or a seven-year-old child. I mean, is this madness? What, what do you want with a child? I'm not suggesting that you should force, it, force yourself on a grown woman, but much less on a defenseless child. So the rates of violence are truly horrific, and um, it may be approaching a pandemic, yes. But when there is a pandemic, we, we alert the WHO. So I don't know who we have alerted on this matter. But with, with your experience from other African countries, mm. do such dehumanization, call it cultural practice, whatever it is, like the lynching of a 90-year-old woman, is it peculiar to Ghana? It is not. Um, it is not. Uh, other African countries manifest very high levels of violence against women. Tanzania is one such country, and I read a report which published in 2015 where they were saying that the civil society organizations had documented the murder of 700 women in a year accused of witchcraft. Countries like the Democratic Republic of Congo, um, Central African Republic. So it is not. And Nigeria, Burkina Faso, it is, it is not peculiar to Ghana. The, the, the difference and the worrying part is that many of those countries are much poorer than Ghana. In fact, the, the authors of some of the studies suggest that in countries where there are extreme levels of poverty, about 40%. Um, some of these accusations are used to grab the property of the, the alleged um, witches, you know, or victims. And Ghana, so Ghana is an outlier because in Ghana, the rates of extreme poverty nationally are about 23%. On the other hand, when you look at some of the areas where um, these witchcraft um, and, and witchcraft allegations are not confined to northern Ghana. They, they happen also in southern Ghana. But when you look at where we have um, these so-called witches camps, etc., in northern Ghana, we also know that we are dealing with regions where poverty levels, extreme poverty levels, are around 50 percent. So in that case, they, they do look more like some of the other countries that I mentioned, you know. All the same, it is worrying, and uh, Ghana sh should not be in this um, category. Um, one of our colleagues, Yaba Beidou, did a film, The Witches of Gambaga, um, um, in 2010. And the BBC also did a film in 2012, No Country for Old Women, Ghana. And they, they, I think that it is 
with all the accolades that we like to heap on ourselves, Ghana is among the 10 fastest growing countries, the World Bank says this, the IMF says this. We really have no business being where we are when it comes to um, witchcraft allegations at all. I mean, this is the time the various political parties are uh, you know, working on their manifestos. And you just said that Ghana is nowhere near where we should be. Would you look straight to this camera? We may not know who is watching us. And, and re-emphasize this point. And if need be, where uh, the issues that you have just raised should fit even in the various manifestos that they are about to present uh, to the, us as Ghanaians. Thank you very much, Reverend. Yes, I would like to reiterate the point that as we celebrate Ghana's achievements and even more where we want to be, that we consider gender-based violence and particularly its manifestation in witchcraft allegations leading to the murder of innocent women, a heinous crime, and we would like to hear the plans that political parties have to eradicate this um, problem. It has been with us for a long time, and I do not recall th that any political party has addressed it in their manifesto to the extent that it leads to the taking of life, and every life is precious. We would want every political party to address it in their manifesto, not just as a, uh, to show that they have got uh, it's a promise, but that they intend to do something concrete about it. It's not about building more camps. Ghana is a sovereign state. We, we reiterate the rights of citizens to live where they choose and not to be banished to live in camps or some a place to feel so insecure in their homes that they have to leave to go to camps. We need to get to the bottom of this issue. We, we have a system where policemen believe in witches, witchcraft uh, nurses believe in, 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 in witches, doctors believe in witchcraft, pastors believe in witchcraft, traditional leaders believe in witchcraft, uh, politicians believe in witchcraft. So we really need to tackle it. Who is going to bail the cat? You know, often allegations get made, but when they get to the police, um, nothing really much happens. I think that the time is now to, we cannot just say ha uh, hashtag justice for queer dente and then allow the time to pass and go on to business as usual. We demand that we attack the problem um, fundamentally and deal with it. And we want to see it in our political party manifestos. We want the candidates to address it. I know that one of the vice presidential candidates has uh, associated herself with this but we want to see the concrete plans in the manifestos for addressing the issue. Viewers, this is what is next. And I'm in conversation with Professor Techua Menu on uh, violence against women. Uh, she will want us to call it gender-based violence. And she's calling for more concrete uh, actions, clear, uh, well thought through policy when it comes to such violence that as a country, we, we, women are going through, and uh, we hope we will get there, that the various parties uh, will, will get, get us there. But, Prof, now there are some unhelpful cultural practices like beheading of people during the death of great chiefs. Now, such things are gradually you know, becoming things of the past, or asking women to vacate the main house and hide themselves like the Akans Oko, Efichire Ko, and those. Now, such things are only mentioned in name, but no uh, practice by any serious family. Why has stagging elderly poor women as which is remained so strong with our various com cultural communities? You just mentioned that police people believe it, nurses, doctors, pastors, politicians. Why has the mindset not changed? Uh, thank you, Reverend. I think that women's citizenship has not been taken seriously in this country. Women 
are very much perceived as decorations, not as full citizens. And you can find it. If you look at our decision-making processes, if you look at the important, you know, I call it, um, I'm sorry you're wearing a suit today, <laughs> but normally I call it a suit. When I, when I see a program on TV and I see all the men wearing the suits, I call it a suit, you know. Sometimes you may have one woman or two women, but women are 51% of this country. Where are they when it comes to taking the serious decisions? Where are they when it comes to industry? You know, so it, it, women have not been integrated into the mainstream of this country. Okay. That is why it is easy to to present them, they are marginalized, they are vulnerable, okay? We do things for them. They, we don't do things, they don't do things themselves. So this, this kind of vulnerability, if you look at our educational statistics, if you look at formal employment, if you look at really the, the movers and shakers in Ghanaian society, yes, we've had two female fe uh, chief justices, We've, got a speak, we've had a Speaker of Parliament, we've had Attorney Generals, all of the female Attorney Generals. They have been gifts of, I'm not suggesting that they were not qualified, very competent women, very competent women. But you go to Parliament and you look at the representation in Parliament, okay? 275 members, 37 women. And I tell everybody, going into this 2020 election, the MPP has 24 female parliamentary candidates. The NDC has 23 female parliamentary candidates, 47. If, even if all of them won, 47 out of 275 is 17%. Okay. So where are women in the political parties, apart from the women's wings, or first national vice chairman or deputy here and there? So I think that if we want to see change, we, we, it has to be holistic. That, that valuing of women. And, and yet we know that our homes would not run without the women. We all, when, when the lockdown came, an exception was made for markets. That's where we all eat. And those women had to brave the possibility of disease and everything, infection, to make sure that we got the food on our tables, you know. So we, we, we really have to reset our, our whole mind and look at our development programs and priorities and where we place women. When we do that, this seeing women and, and ensuring, you know, that women are equally represented. We are talking, we are 51%, but we're willing to do 50-50, mm -hmm. hmm? not 51-49, 50-50 give women the opportunities. If I didn't have the opportunity, I'm 68, somebody could tag me as a witch. Nobody would dare call me a witch in my family or anywhere else. This is what happens when women are poor, uneducated, widows, women without children. They are the ones who become the witches in our older women. Not always older women. In the, in the Witches of Gambaga film, our colleague Yaba, there were women in their 30s who were also tagged as witches. Sometimes they were prosperous, they were running chop bars, etc. I, I remember a woman in the film, she had had a quarrel with her brother's wife or something, and in the night, the, the following night, the, the sister-in-law's child died. So they said she was the witch, you know? So it, is this tagging, this targeting, you know, usually of women who have no support behind them, you know. And, of course, sometimes their own children tag them as witches. Eh? I was reading an account of a, a young man who said that he went somewhere and he was impotent and he was told that it was his mother who had made him impotent. He killed his mother, you know. So these beliefs thrive in particular environments, you know. So we also need to attack the environments that breed those kinds of, of beliefs. And of course, the impunity that goes along with it. 
all these years that witchcraft allegations have been going on? How many people are in prison for, for witchcraft allegations? How many people have been jailed for these accusations, you know? And many of those poor women who get tagged, who, who, who are driven out of villages, etc. You know, and we, we mustn't only think of even the economic, um, the, the, soci the economic consequence, but also the social. In, 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 the, in the BBC film, No Country for Old Women, the woman was talking about how she used to look, her daughter had twins, and she was the one who used to look after the twins. And one of her worries was, will she see the twins again, you know? And I mean, this, this emotional attachment, you know, we, we, we need to think of people as human beings and um, what happens to them when they are attacked, beaten, um, and dragged out, you know? I don't know. You know, I was, when, when, because of this program, I started thinking and I remembered that my own father, my grandmother, was tagged as a witch by her grandchildren. My, my grandmother had two daughters. One of them never had children. The one who had children, whose children my father supported. In fact, some of them had gone abroad you know, etc. So one of them came back and went to the village. They were, he was told that my grandmother was at the farm. He went to the farm and my grandmother was excited. Her grandson had come to the farm. Oh, Kofi, you know, went on and um, uprooted cassava and cocoa yams, etc. You know, because he had been brought to the farm with a, by a young boy. And then the young boy carried the things to the, back to the village. When they got to the house, my grandmother discovered that there was a whole group of people assembled there. And now the grandson who had come to the farm joined his brothers and then they, they accused my grandmother of witchcraft, told him that if he did not make them as rich as her son, meaning my father, they would kill her and kill themselves. My grandmother started crying. It was really an emotional issue. But the consequence of it was that my father actually cut his ties with his nephews. Even when his sister died, he did not go to the funeral, you know? And my father removed my grandmother from the village and she came to live with us in Kumasi. And she lived in Kumasi until her death, okay? So imagine that she did not have a son who could have protected her? What could have happened to her? I'm not talking about the North. I'm talking about Ashanti. So these things, these beliefs are rife. These practices are rife. They may be loud. They may be muted. But they exist. People believe it. And especially now, with the proliferation of um, deliverance churches and malams and soothsayers and stuff, you know, especially... Poor and vulnerable women are subject to this. And you mentioned malams and pastors when it comes to the tagging that you mentioned earlier on. But it's like they, I mean, they as pastors, malams, traditional priests, have remained perpetuators of such violence against women. However, if you look at the history of uh, prosecution of religious leaders, it gives the impression that Spiritual matters cannot be investigated. And so they are allowed to go scot-free. Pastors can just say, your mother is a witch, go home and misbehave. And whatever happens, how many pastors? You mentioned, uh, you asked earlier on how many of such people have been jailed. And, and I don't know why, and you are a legal person also, that this idea that spiritual matters cannot be investigated and so pastors, imams, uh, traditional priests seriously can cause this harm and they still walk about freely. Well, Safu, I can assure you that in the law, um, all are equal before the law and, and there is no protection of any of such people before the law. So if it is not happening, it's not because the law does not allow it, it's because society and the leadership of society has not
taking it seriously. I, I think that um, it's good that we are speaking. You are a reverend minister yourself. You have your councils and your associations. And um, I think that um, it is good. I saw that the Ghana Pentecostal uh, Council and Charismatic, uh, Ghana Pentecostal and Charismatic Council came out to condemn the killing of uh, Madame Pia Dente and asked for the closing down of the uh, witches camps. But I think that we need more than that. I think that um, the Christian Council, the Catholic Secretariat, the Ghana Pentecostal and Charismatic Council itself, the associations of um, traditional religions and the Muslim uh, um, Council, etc. They all really need to uh, come out to, to set rules for their members and to let them know that they will not shelter them if they fall afoul of the law. Whilst the police and the, the government should also be much more alive to their responsibilities and prosecute people without fear or favor, you know, that the same way the, the, the blood of Madame Equia Dente is as precious as the blood of any pastor or any perpetrator. And, and I think that we really should see that happening because so far there does not appear to be that will, the political will or commitment to see through. And we, we just allow things to slide in this country. There are many things that we know are wrong, but nobody talks about it. And as, it's as if if we don't talk about it, if we don't act on it, it will just go away. But what it does is that it emboldens people because you know that it happened and nothing happened to anybody. You know, even this Madame Equia Dente case, the, there's a radio station in the Savannah region which reported that the same week that that woman died, 23 other women were being exercised for witchcraft. So it was not an isolated incident. And then um, I think there is an institute called the Sane Institute. They came out with a, a, a statement about some young man who is a JSS dropout, who has a certified mental problem. And he has also set up a camp and is been exercising witches. They have gone to the police. They have done everything. Nobody has dared to act against this young man. So it is the impunity that we allow these people to have that somehow they are above any kind of law. And as I said, because the people who must enforce the law themselves believe these things, they, they, they appear helpless or weak or unwilling or unable to enforce the law. So we do have the laws. It's not for the lack of it. We do have the law in the criminal code, in the constitution. There are laws. But who is enforcing the law? And you are calling the various religious groups to, to educate their members and let them know that we want to do Will you again uh, emphasize this uh, to our viewers? We may not know who is watching us. You mentioned traditional leaders. That we've reached a point. It's not a novel thing. Now I keep hearing you that there's a, it a spread. It's a spread. And, and, and talk to our viewers, especially religious leaders and traditional leaders you mentioned earlier on. Thank you very much. You know, the, if you look at the Constitution in the Directive Principles of State Policy, it talks about um, the houses of chiefs and traditional authorities looking at um, adopting and adapting traditional practices to accord to the needs of the people. So in other words, culture, nothing is static, things change. And I am yet to see some practice that has been actively adapted by our traditional authorities. I know that in the wake of HIV AIDS, some uh, in uh, Krobo and uh, Manya Krobo in some areas, some of the practices around depot, etc., have been adapted. I know that um, female genital mutilation, um, they have been, especially in other countries, how to convey the essence of womanhood without cutting. Mm -hmm. Although I, I have, I'm engaged in research now where I've come across something called 
uh, uh, ironing the clitoris, which is even more frightening to me than female genital mutilation, you know, or as part of female genital mutilation. So, but, but I'm saying that we, we have written a fine constitution, we have put in a lot of clauses, but we have not actively been activating those clauses. There are so many silent things in the constitution, including, for instance, the spousal rights bill, including the affirmative action law, etc. But I'm also saying that according to our laws, if you are a perpetrator or even a participant at one of these ceremonies, <coughs> you are also infringing the law. And we know that a lot of people are encouraged in their beliefs by pastors, by various religious, I call them religious charlatans, huh? various religious and traditional charlatans who encourage people. Your mother is a witch. You hear it all the time. The witchcraft that is sitting on you, that is not allowing you to prosper. That woman you saw in your dreams. All these kinds of so-called prophecies, you know. And I think that the different religious and traditional authorities should call their members to order, should let them know that when they, if they encourage these practices, and perpetrators are arrested, they will not be sheltered by their members. I think that we, we believe in God, we are religious people, but it does not mean that that should lead us to kill each other, that should not lead us to commit crimes. And, and uh, it is about time that uh, a stop was put to these practices. We want to hear the Christian Council, we want to hear the Pentecostal Council, we want to hear the Catholic uh, Secretariat, we want to hear the Muslim um, councils. We want to hear the leadership of the Association of Traditional um, Religions coming out and warning their members about the, their withdrawal or their lack of support for these actions and that they will support the law to take action against it. We also want to hear our Houses of Chiefs take action to ensure that customary practices that are dehumanizing as set out in, our, in the Constitution are actively adapted and, uh, and changed so that we can protect lives and the human rights of people. Viewers, this is What is Next? And I'm in conversation with Professor Techua Menu, and she is calling the various faith-based organizations, Christian Council, Catholic Bishop Conference, Ghana Pentecostal charismatic traditional leaders, Muslim leaders, that we must withdraw our support to some of our members, whether in sermon, their teaching, prophecies, that you know, seem to suggest uh, 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 support to some of these violent against women, that this is the time that in her words, we must withdraw our support. Prof. Does the affirmative action bill have enough responses to the uh, domestic violence? Actually, we have a Domestic Violence Act, Act 732 of 2007. And of course, uh, the, that act was passed in response to demands by especially the civil, civil, civil society organizations for government to take action against violence that was happening predominantly in the home, but not only in the home. So we do have an act. The affirmative action bill has not been passed. We are still waiting for it to be passed. But it's been long. It's been a long time. It has not been passed. Uh, it has gone to parliament several times, and then it lapses with our parliament. There's one in parliament now. We are watching. We know that parliament will rise soon and we, we are watching to see what will happen. And you know the CDD has, um, has done, the CDD Ghana has done a, a manifesto report and it's, what it did was a national consultation to bring out issues that are important to people. 
So the passage of the Affirmative Action Law is in that manifesto report. And of course, we've got a, a, a manifesto, an Affirmative Action Coalition that has also been pushing for that law to be passed. But in terms of domestic violence, gender-based violence, we already have a law. As to whether that law is being enforced, um, and, but, but the issues of witchcraft, they are dealt with in the criminal code. In the criminal code. Because if, if you put it under affirmative action or domestic violence, it would suggest that there has to be some kind of a, a domestic relationship between the perpetrators and the victims. You know, of course, one of the uh, persons who has been charged in the case of uh, Madame Equiadente, who has been arraigned before court, claims to be a granddaughter or something. But you don't need to have a relationship. But we have adequate laws. Let me, let me, section 315 of our criminal code punishes a person who directs or controls or precise at a trial by ordeal. So the soothsayer would be covered by this section uh, 315 of our criminal code. Article 15 of the Constitution also says that it's a violation of the dignity of a person to subject them to torture, cruel, or other inhuman, degrading treatment or punishment. And these people, in, in the case of a felony, it is punishable by death, like if it is a murder, like what happened, it is punishable by death. Okay, so we already have enough laws to, to, to deal with um, some of these issues. So the problem has not been the lack of the law, the problem has been the enforcement mm -hmm. of the law. You know, Ghana, we like passing laws, so we have a lot of laws and policies, but many of them are not implemented or enforced. So I'm suggesting that we have enough laws in this country. The real issue is the enforcement of the law. So in this case, we do have the law and we are waiting to see what will happen. And you call for enforcement of, of our laws. Now, how can we mobilize civil society groups, you know, just to be part of the process? And especially I have in mind, now we have vibrant media in Ghana. Where, 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 where is media when it comes to this uh, public support, public campaign uh, on such unfortunate situations that we are going through? Well, I believe that the media has been supportive. Um, the Zamire uh, radio in uh, the Savannah region has been very good in, in terms of reporting the issues. But also the civil society organizations, Sontaba, NORSAC, groups like that, they, they sounded the alert on, on these issues. We know that uh, uh, the women and orphans movement in Bogatanga was, was instrumental in getting um, some young man who had put a video out about um, the, the torture of, of some of these women out arrested. So I think that the civil society groups have been playing their part. The media has been supportive, not usually in being the leaders, but at least in, in giving voice, giving space for, for the groups you know, to do that. So, but we are not the government. We, we, we play supportive and advocacy roles. And yes, um, the president, the minister for gender, everybody has come out and spoken against this particular action. But we're suggesting that it is a much broader problem and we don't want it to be episodic, you know, um, limited to this action and then we go on merrily. This is a persistent issue and we need to pick it up, you know. How are we going to eradicate it? How do we educate children in schools? How do we let them know that whatever their private beliefs, they cannot form the basis of public action, you know, that brings harm to other people and that when they do, they can be punished. That a nurse or a policeman cannot substitute his private judgment when 
a complaint is made. And therefore, because of his private judgment, he decides, he or she decides that this is not something to be pursued. Go and settle it, you know, because this is, it's these private settlements, this privatization of, of, of real harm that allows people to continue. And then, and people get frustrated. One of the civil society groups that we work with was telling us about a case that had been filed. And sometimes, you know, the, the investigation is, is, is made, uh, excuse me to say, bizarre, like it, it's not rigorously investigated. So it makes it very difficult to build a case. You know, yeah, just yesterday, I was invited by Dosu to the opening of a, a case docket management training course at the detective police detective training academy because they know and um, I, I have been doing some research I talked to a judge recently and one of her complaints was that sometimes the case is before you you know that um, something has happened somebody has has suffered grievous harm and yet the the docket the way the the case has been managed you cannot go on with the prosecution so it is important that we have professional prosecutors who are sworn to do their duty by the constitution not by their private beliefs that way we can get convictions prof are you optimistic about the future oh i'm an optimist i i mean if we were not then what would we do your last word to my viewers Thank you very much, uh, Osofo, for giving me the time to, um, to be with you this afternoon. I think that we have been talking about important issues. Um, we live in a society where weak and vulnerable women, poor women, but also assertive or eccentric women can be tagged as witches. And uh, the chief... Uh, uh, meant officer of the Mental Health Authority recently said that some of the people who are tagged as witches may be suffering psychological problems. They need to be helped, you know, instead of being tagged. So I think that as a society, we need to come together and confront the issue, ensure that those who need help are getting the help, ensure that communities understand the consequences of their actions, and continue education and bring everybody on board and prosecute offenses when they occur, show that poor women cannot just be dispensed with. Otherwise, it's like we're dealing with uh, people in society who are not deemed as useful to society. They are not powerful. They don't have anybody behind them. But Ghana is for everybody. We need to build inclusive societies, respectful societies that upholds the human rights and dignity of men and women. So my hope is that going forward, we will have honest conversations about these issues, that we will recognize our roles, and that the different bodies, religious, traditional, legal, governmental, and otherwise, will play their roles, play their leadership roles, and ensure that this problem is eradicated. Ghana should be a country for old, young, um, healthy, disabled. It, it should be a society for all. It, we, we need to take away this tag of Ghana being a no country for old women. It's disgraceful. Viewers, this is what is next. This is how far time will allow us. I have been in conversation with Professor Abena Techua Menu on violence against women or domestic violence. And she's calling for a national honest conversation, a conversation that brings everybody on board. For her, we need to build a country that everybody is needed. We don't give impression that somebody is not needed. Poor, elderly, women, child, children, whoever. Ghana must have space for everybody. My name is Kabuno Pune from Paul. I'll come your way same time next week. Till then, may God bless our homeland Ghana. Make this dear nation of ours great and strong.